All right, we're live. we're live. Welcome everybody. everybody. Today, oh, I got to. So we'll just ask if you're not speaking to mute your phone, and if you're on the phone, I believe it's star six to mute yourself and unmute yourself. Is that right, Clerk? This is a. Uh... Curtis, I'm very hard to hear you. Clerk. Okay. Uh, anyway, we're we're here uh, t tonight's meeting at Hal Hal West Community Council. Uh, we have quorum, and before we start, just make sure everyone's audio is on. Uh, Councillor Morse. Yes, I'm present. Great, thank you, Councillor Mason. Present and correct, Mr. Chair, sir. Thank you, Councillor Cleary. I am here. Thanks for having me. All right, Councilor Studdard. I am I am present and accounted for for District 12. Thank you, and Councilor Cattle. I am here representing District 11. So all the new councilors, have you got used to being called Councilor yet? Have you have you got over that period? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know it takes some getting used to. Uh, so, uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, if you're not speaking, please keep your microphone on mute. And if you're on the phone, uh, you can uh, mute and unmute yourself by pressing star six um, when it's your turn to speak or when you uh, are called on. So first I call uh, or ask for approval of the minutes December 9th and December 16th. Moved. Councilor Cleary, second. Moved by Councilor Mason, second by Councilor Cleary. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Being none opposed, that passes. Proof of the order of business. Uh, any any changes at all from councilors? Nope, seeing none. Uh, ask for a motion to approve the order of business. Moved by Councillor Stoddard, second by Councillor Cuddle. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Seeing none, uh, calls, calls for declaration of conflict of interest. Do you have any, please? Nope, seeing none. All right, so let's get to the meat of the meeting. So we have some public hearings tonight, um, starting with 5.1, uh, case 22617, typically Lakeside Beachville Land Use by Law Amendment for 207 and 209 Greedhead Road. Lakeside. And before I call on, on Megan Mo to present, I just re remember that this is a public hearing and we'll call upon the applicants when needed. So after the staff presentation, I uh, will have 10 minutes for the applicant to, to uh, speak and we will then go to the members who have signed up to speak tonight. And uh, those members are Curtis Refuge and Reg Rankin, and we'll call upon you after the presentation from the applicant, and we will start with uh, the presentation from staff, please. Thank you, and good evening, Mr. Chair and Councillors. I'll wait for my presentation to pop up on the screen there for everyone to see. Perfect. Um, so uh, my name is Megan Mond and I am a planner with HRM's planning application group. And tonight I will be presenting for the public hearing of case 22617, which is an application to amend the Timberley Lakeside Beachville land use bylaw for 207 and 209 Greenhead Road. Next slide, please. So the applicant is Lloyd Robbins, who has submitted this application on behalf of the property owner. And as I mentioned, the application is for 207 and 209 Greenhead Road, and this property is located in Lakeside. The proposal is to amend the land use bylaw to enable a path forward to legalize two additions to an existing commercial automotive garage. This involves rezoning the property and adding text to the C3 zone. Next slide, please. The subject property is near the end of Greenhead Road, and Greenhead Road is accessed from St. Margaret's Bay Road and ends near Highway 103, um, as you can see there on the image on the left. 
The site is predominantly surrounded by low rise residential development. So the image on the right there, you can see that it shows the approximate site boundaries and then that the site is abutting a mobile home park. And then the mobile home park is uh, just for reference there to the north of it is Brunello Golf Course, which you can see there on the image on the left. And then a little to the east of the site on the other side of Greenhead Road is the Adsom House. And to the southwest is a branch of the Canadian Legion. And then as you can see to the south there, it is vacant wooded land. Next slide, please. So here is a closer view of the site. You can see the garage in the middle of the property there. And then beside it is a single unit dwelling. Next slide, please. So here is an image of the garage that uh, was taken earlier this month. This is the view of the garage from the driveway as you enter the site from Greenhead Road. Next slide, please. The site is designated urban residential. The urban residential or UR designation constitutes the priority area for continuing residential development in Timberley Lakeside Beachville. So at the time the urban residential policies were adopted in 1982, there were various existing commercial and industrial uses on the lands within this designation. In 1992, Council adopted a policy, policy UR20, to acknowledge these existing uses, and it is this policy that is the enabling policy for this application. Next slide, please. So policy UR20 enables the continued use of existing commercial and industrial properties through the application of the commercial service zone, which is also known as the C3 zone. The policy specifies that this zone permits service commercial uses with up to 5,000 square feet in floor area. The policy does not enable future rezonings to C3, although staff have the lands within the UR designation could not be rezoned to C3 today to enable the um, establishment of a new commercial service use. The applicant has provided staff with proof that the commercial garage has been in existence since the mid 1970s, so therefore they're not seeking to establish a new commercial use, but to recognize the existence of an existing one. Policy IM12 is the implementation policy that provides criteria for council to consider for land use bylaw amendment applications. The criteria includes that the proposal is in conformity with the intent of the MPS and with the requirements of all other municipal bylaws and regulations, and that there are controls placed on the development, which in this case would be the existing C3 zone regulations. Next slide, please. So the property is partially zoned R3, which is the mobile dwelling zone, and partially zoned P2, which is the community facility zone. On the property today, there's the commercial automotive garage with two additions and the dwelling. So the garage that I showed you in the earlier image, that sits on the portion of the property that is zoned R3. And the R3 zone does not permit commercial garages. However, the original commercial garage, so the garage without the two additions, is considered a non-conforming use because it existed before the land use bylaw came into effect. So as such, the garage in its original form is permitted to remain as it existed at the time of the adoption of the land use bylaw. Next slide, please. So there were two additions built to the garage, one around 2008 and one around 2010, and these additions made the structure non-compliant with municipal regulations. So on the site plan that um, in front of you here, I have highlighted the original footprint of the garage, which I hope you can see here. Um, the original garage was built around the mid 1970s and it's highlighted there in the dashed lighter blue line. And then the darker blue solid line represents the footprint of the garage today with those two additions. So the applicant is seeking the rezoning and text amendment to have a path forward to legalize the two additions that were built without the permits in place. So if council um, is to approve this application, the property owner still does have to apply for construction permits for those two additions. And the additions in any future development on the site would then be subject to the requirements of the C3 zone. Next slide, please. So the applicant has requested two amendments to the land use bylaw. The first is to amend the zoning map by rezoning the majority of the site from R3 and P2 to C3 
There is a small portion of the site which is captured on the inset map outlined in red on the slide that will remain zoned R3. Uh, that's because there's an existing mobile dwelling that's encroaching onto the property and mobile dwellings are not permitted in the C3 zone. So therefore the applicant has chosen to exclude that portion of the property from the rezoning. And the second component of the amendment is a text amendment to the C3 zone. So in the C3 zone, the existing uses are individually identified on a list of permitted existing uses. RJD Automotive, which is the name of the garage, would be added to that list. Next slide, please. So in terms of public engagement, uh, the level of engagement was consultation achieved through a mail out notification, a web page and signage on the site. Overall, the feedback was generally supportive of the application. Respondents noted that they think a garage benefits their community and they appreciate having a place to get their car fixed in their neighborhood. One respondent did express concerns that there may be chemicals from the garage leaking into a nearby creek. Um, this concern was forwarded to Department of Environment as it fell within their jurisdiction and Nova Scotia Department of Environment investigated and they advised that there was no further need for an investigation of this. We sent 183 mail outs inviting residents to provide feedback on the application. I received 11 calls and two emails and the web page was viewed approximately 69 unique times since it was posted in February 2020. Next slide, please. So staff recommend that Halifax and West Community Council adopt the amendment to the land use bylaw for Timberley Lakeside Beachville as set out in attachment A of the staff report. Next slide, please. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Any questions of clarification from members of council? All right, seeing none, I will ask uh, Mr. Robbins uh, to unmute your phone or, or indicate you can hear me. You can use star six. Lloyd Robbins here. OK, great. Welcome. OK, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Just make sure other members can hear you as well. Just give me a head nod. Yep, they can. So you have 10 minutes um, to to uh, talk about your application. And if there's any questions, clear, clarification from members, you'll you'll hear those. So you have 10 minutes. I would thank Megan Megan Vaughn for her presentation. I think she's she's covered most of the issues already, um, so I doubt that I'll take the 10, 10 minutes. Um, the Smith family has operated a garage in the on the Greenhead Road from at least the 60s or 70s. The first garage was 200 yards away from the current garage was operated by his father. Um, when you look at property online mapping, you'll know, you, you would note that uh, Russell Smith owns the garage property that we're trying to rezone. He also owns the property next door, facing it on the right hand side, uh, which is where the old garage was. And he also owns the property on the left, uh, where his son lives. So in terms of impact on the community, um, he is the community. The mobile home park in the back um, is focused away from his garage and there's trees and a fence in between. Across the road is government land and it's undeveloped and he's at the very end of the Greenhead Road. Um, so the when in 2002 he moved to the site of the current garage and has been operating there since then. That garage had been owned by a Mr. Howard and had been operated as a commercial garage since 1975, which is the background for the legal non-conforming use. Um, Mr. Smith, when he operated the garage, did do two ex extensions on the garage. And unfortunately, when he did that, he did not get a permit which is the main reason we are here now. 
Um, he had pled guilty to that, and he paid a substantial fine, and his goal in life now is to become a legal part of HRM. Um, and he knows the importance of that. The, the policy that we're working under is called the UR20, and um, the preamble to UR20 was, is a recognition that the settlement pattern in the Lakeside Timberley area uh, was a mixed-use mixed-use mixed-use. There wasn't any planning there. I think the first plan was 1982. I could be wrong with that, but I think that is, that is it, or 87, 82 or 87. Um, the, the when they did the policy UR20, the recognition was this is a mixed-use and it's integrated, these commercial uses have integrated into their respective communities. And they came up with the policy UR20, which we are under. Um, in my mind, I feel that what we're doing tonight is something that probably should have been done back in 1992. I have no idea um, why it was missed, but it clearly fits within the policy. If we're successful tonight, uh, there is no planned new construction at all. Um, we are trying to legalize the construction that we have done, and we've had informal meetings with the building inspectors, inspector to understand exactly what we need to do to complete this, and we feel that we can complete this. Um, I've given you two slides. Um, one, which is the site plan, which Megan has already presented. If you look at that site plan, you'll see that it's, I think the acreage is around two acres that we will be able to meet with no difficulty all side yard requirements and any other requirements in the zone. Uh, and as I previously said, we are very buffered from other uses. I've also submitted a slide which gives the street view um, and it's a little further out than where, where Megan took her picture, and you can see that there's a line of trees there and that we're set in back. So there's little um, interaction with the, the street, the street, street. So the site doesn't interfere with the natural landscape of, of the area. We're, we're in the back. So I don't think there's much more I need to say say tonight. I I am prepared to answer questions. Mr. Mr. Um, Smith is with me, and he would answer questions also if you do have any questions. And with that, I thank HRM for the opportunity to make this application, and I'm hoping and trusting that it will be a favorable outcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Robbins. I'll just look to the committee to see if there's any questions and clar clarification from them. All right, seeing none, uh, thank you again for the presentation. So now we will open the public hearing. So those who have registered before the deadline, 4.30 p.m., uh, business day prior to the hearing are uh, able to speak. And we have two registered speakers tonight. Um, and if you are on the phone, remember that to unmute and mute yourself, star six. And the first uh, person to speak is Curtis Refuge. Can you hear me? We can hear you. You have five minutes. Hello, can you can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, we, we got you. Welcome to the committee. You have five minutes. Good evening. My name is Curtis Rafuse. I reside at 119 Greenhead Road. I've been a resident of Greenhead Road here for 12 years. I was a resident on 9 First Street prior to this for six years. I just want to say that I have never had any problems with the Smith family. Um, right now, I'm pretty well, I'm 65, and uh, a few times a young fellow drives by, uh, 
Russell's uh, junior, and he plows my driveway for me. I just want to add that I think some people have already said this, that the community needs those people. The Smiths are great. Um, say, I've been on this street for forever, and there's been no problems whatsoever. I've even seen uh, Mr. Smith come down and uh, clear clear out for us one time when it was really bad so we so so the older people could get out so i think it's a good thing and again i think it is long overdue and uh, i think that's about all i have to say other than thank you to the council for your time and i hope everybody can be safe thank you we appreciate that and appreciate your time tonight uh quick and precise now moving on to our second speaker mr reg ranking i think you might know who this is Mr. Ranking, are you there? Star six to unmute yourself if you are muted. Can you hear me? We got you. Welcome. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Councillor, and Councillors. Good evening. I'm speaking in support of the staff recommendation to rezone the subject lands. That is the portion of lands at 207, 209 Greenhead Road from P2 and R3 to C3, the service business zone, to allow for an existing garage to be expanded. Had the owner, John Howard, informed the time of the creation of the C3 zone back in 1992, this proposal would not, would have been positively dealt with by adding this property to Appendix A. And the issue would not be before you today. This is a true feature of this application, as I was the local councillor who brought forward this bylaw. Your planning department, the lead planner, Paul Morgan, assisted me greatly in the design of the C3 song. It was made for this kind of application. Well, this C3 song, with only a grandfather status, will not allow this operation to require loans or even construct building additions, which of course would be within the defined limits of the C3 zone. This is precisely what the other businesses listed on Appendix A in your report pressed for and achieved with the passage of C3. Let it be so extended today to this business. For the record, I am here to state that as the local councilor, for the area from 1991 to 2016, a quarter century of continuous representation, there was not one complaint received from the public with the operation of this business. And today, it supports three families. My father, Mr. Russell Smith, and his two sons. Today, I see that your planning department continues to be in good hands staff report before you, in my opinion, is very well done. I believe that respectfully, there's at least a moral obligation to approve this application because I can see no good reason can be found to deny the applicants this due consideration which they seek of you. They have paid the price levied by the court for building that addition without a permit. They have paid far beyond that price for consultative services for this application before you. I respectfully expect fair consideration from the newly elected local councillors and that she may, and the local councillors may put a positive motion on the floor already prepared by your staff. In conclusion, if for some reason there's not a positive motion, I fully expect it's required to note by your staff in the report and a motion to refuse be substantiated by stating the reason as this would in all likelihood be appealed to the utility board. I certainly do not see a motion to refuse happening, nor choose in, in the alternative to approve but with amendment. This is also advised by staff would also be appealable to the utility board. What is fair today? is allowing the Smith family to leave this terrible experience behind them, which they themselves offered if circumstances 
causing the municipality's reaction to take them to court. Let us allow them today to have their day in your court, if you will, by allowing this property to C3 zone. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rankin. Uh, I don't see any members for questions or clarification. So again, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, and that is the end of our registered speakers um, for tonight's hearing. I uh, ask uh, Mr. Robbins if you want to rebuttal anything that you heard tonight. Uh, I, I'm not going to make assumptions, but I, I feel that uh, most of the comments were in line with yours, but I'll, I'll give you a chance to rebuttal if you'd like to. Lloyd Robbins here. I would thank, like to thank uh, former Councillor Rankin for his comments and also the gentleman before. I didn't quite catch his name. Uh, I think they provided good support for what we want to do, and I thank them. That's all. Great. Thank you. Um, so on that note, I will ask for a motion to close the public hearing. Moved by I'd Councillor. Like to repeat my name for that gentleman, if I could. Yep, sure. Curtis Rayfuse. Thank you, Mr. Rayfuse. Curtis Rayfuse, just in case you didn't get that, Lloyd. And thank you again. All right, appreciate it. Um, so I ask motion for public hearing to be closed. Moved by Councilor Clary. Councilor. Second, second by Councilor Cuddle. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Seeing none. Uh, and I believe that uh this would be moved by councillor stoddard um so i'm just making sure yep that's so if you'd like to put the motion on the floor uh you could do that and we'll go from there thank you mr chair i move that halifax and west community council adopt the amendment to the land use bylaw for timberley lakeside and beachville as set out in the attachment a of the staff report dated September 30th, 2020, with the revised map two. I second, second. Councilor Cleary. Thank Moved you. Moved by Councilor Stoddard, second by Councilor Cleary. Any comments, Councilor Stoddard? No, I've been in this area and everything that I've seen matches uh, up with the staff report. Um, everything is in line, the trees, the tree lining is there. Um, the residents are in favor of this um, location and this business. I haven't heard anything to the contrary that they don't want it there. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, any other members looking to speak on this subject? I don't see anyone in the chat. Everyone's shaking their heads, so I would ask the question be called. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Seeing none, that motion passes. Uh, great, thank you colleagues. Moving on to the next item, uh, case 5.1.2, sorry, item 5.1.2, case 229781588 Greenhead Road, Lakeside, Action Association for Women and Children. And this is also a public hearing. I'll go through the rules after we're done really quickly, but we have staff, on this, I believe so. Yes, I see you. Hello, Jacqueline. Thank you for being here, and I will let you take it away. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me okay? Perfect. Um, I'll just wait for the presentation to um, get loaded up. Sorry, before you go, just want to make sure from the clerk that we have everyone that we're, that's needed for uh, this this item uh, here. Yes, everyone is present in the meeting. OK, great. Thank you. OK, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of Halifax and West Community Council. My name is Jacqueline Blill. I'm the HRM planner presenting this application this evening. Slide two, please. So this is an application by the Affordable Housing Association of Nova Scotia on behalf of the Adsum Association for Women and Children who own the subject property, 158 Greenhead Road, Lakeside. And the application is to redevelop the existing residential care facility on the site. Slide three, please. So 
So this slide shows the location of the community of Lakeside, just west of Beachville and Halifax and north of Highway 103. Slide four, please. And this slide shows the subject property shaded in gray and outlined in red within the community context, just up from the site that was actually the subject of the previous public hearing. Uh, the site is 2.27 hectares in area, that's 5.6 acres, and has 198 meters or 650 feet of frontage on Greenhead Road. You'll note the location of the property on Greenhead Road is about, is about midway between the St. Margaret's Bay Road and Highway 103. You'll also note the Alderwood Village opposite Greenhead Road and to the north of the property, and that the existing building on the property is positioned towards the southern property line. Slide five, please. So this slide shows an aerial photo of the site. I've tried to add a very approximate indication of the property boundary in yellow, and this is just to better illustrate the position of the building on the site and show the location of existing vegetation. Slide six, please. So I have a few photos of the site that were taken last week. I've tried to illustrate with numbers on the map to the left and the location, the locations where the photos were taken and the direction that the camera was pointing. Uh, photo one was taken on the approach to the property coming from the St. Margaret's Bay Road in the direction looking up Greenhead Road. Um, you can see homes within the Alderwood Village development on the right side of that photo. Photo two was taken from Greenhead Road as well, and you can see the kind of the center coming into view on the left hand side of the road. Slide seven, please. So photos three and four were also taken from Greenhead Road opposite, coming from the opposite approach. In photo three, you can see the current location of the waste containers at the front of the site. Slide eight, please. So to provide an overview of the planning policy applicable for this application, the site is designated urban settlement under the Regional Municipal Planning Strategy. It's designated urban residential under the Timberley Lakeside Beachville Municipal Planning Strategy. Policy UR17 is the policy within that plan which enables consideration of residential care facilities through the development agreement process. And policy IM12 is the implementation policy that contains additional policy criteria that must be considered for planning applications such as development agreements. And at this time, I just wanna acknowledge a correction to the staff report. The staff report identifies policy IM11 as the implementation policy for this plan, and that is incorrect. Those references should reflect policy IM12. So my apologies for that. I'm sorry if that causes any confusion. Slide nine, please. So to speak, very briefly to the underlying zoning, the R2 zone, um, which is the two unit dwelling zone, permits limited residential uses, which would be single and two unit dwellings with the ability to also have some daycare and home business functions, as well as a variety of community uses. In terms of the community uses permitted, the R2 zone permits most institutional uses as defined and shown on the next slide. So slide 10, please. So the land use bylaw defines institutional use as those uses that are listed within the P2 zone. What's not listed here is residential care facilities, and this is because the plan policy directs that they be considered by development agreement. Slide 11, please. So before I go any further in discussing plan policies, I just wanna take a brief moment to summarize the planning history of the site. The existing building was already established and used as a school on the site when the Timberley Lakeside Beachville planning documents came into effect in 1982. So to reflect the use of the property as a school, the property was zoned P2, which is the community facility zone. After the building ceased to be used as a school, the Timberley and Area Lions Club leased the building. It was during that time period that the planning documents were revised in 1992 and the R2 zone was applied. The property was purchased from the municipality in 2001 by ADSM to establish the current residential care facility on the site. A development agreement was required and was approved by the former Western Region Community Council in 2002. So the current facility has been operating at this location since that time. Slide 12, please. So delving into the plan policy, as previously mentioned, policy UR17 enables the consideration of residential care facilities within the urban residential designation. Within this designation, the plan prioritizes the continuation and protection of established low density residential development, but also acknowledges that compatible institutional uses support a more diverse residential environment. The NPS also states that it's common for many types of community facility uses to locate in residential neighborhoods in order to facilitate the social and physical integration of the people served by these facilities. 
The NPX directs the development agreement process for residential care facilities to ensure compatibility concerns are adequately addressed. So I've displayed the policy on these slides. I won't go into the policy criteria in detail as staff's review of the proposal against the policy is all contained within attachment C of the staff report that's before Community Council, but I will point out subsections B and subsection C consideration for on-site facilities that may be required for facility users and the design and scale of the buildings relative to the surrounding residential neighborhood. Both of these we'll discuss when we take a look at the proposal on a few slides. Slide 13, please. So as mentioned again um, and corrected, <laughs> policy IM12 contains additional factors that must be considered for all planning applications. There are quite a few here. They take up two slides, um, but again, the detailed review is in the staff report. Slide. 14, please. And there is a little bit of repetition. Um, you'll see subsection C2 also deals with the physical form of any proposed buildings. Slide 15, please. So while council is very much aware, I just wanted to highlight for information regarding HRM's affordable housing work for the benefit of those members of the public that are tuning in from home. On this slide, you'll note a number of items that relate to our affordable housing work. And while this is not a complete list, these examples speak to the importance of affordable housing in HRM and more recently HRM has been involved as a partner in securing federal funds for affordable housing projects. Slide 16 please. And as Council is aware a new source of funding was announced last fall in support of affordable housing projects. Through the Rapid Housing Initiative Halifax was allocated over eight and a half million dollars to provide a minimum of 28 units of affordable housing. Through this initiative, HRM has partnered with the nonprofit sector on three affordable housing projects, and this project is one of them. But what's important to note now and what was noted when these projects were selected by Regional Council is that the approval of any planning applications associated with these projects must be in considered in accordance with the applicable planning policy. So in this case, that's policy UR17 and IM12. Slide 17, please. So just before I speak to the specifics of the proposal, I want to discuss the public feedback, and this is because the announcement of the Rapid Housing Initiative funds caused a redesign of the proposal, and the public provided feedback on the original design that was initially submitted. Um, so the public consultation for this application took the form of a mail out notification letter and information sharing through our standard application webpage on Halifax.ca. Uh, 217 notification letters were mailed to properties within the notification area that's illustrated on the map to the right of the slide within the red line. I just wanted to note that this is the same notification area that we used as we used back in 2002 for the existing original development agreement. Slide 18, please. So as of last week, the web page for this application had 227 unique page views and the length of time per view averaged about four minutes. Uh, in terms of feedback received, I've had contact with seven individuals through email and phone. Um, concerns expressed related to smoking off-site in the neighborhood, the entertaining of men off-site in the neighborhood, the presence of rats around the waste containers, and trespassing across adjacent lawns and driveways. Slide 19, please. So I do have a close-up of these plans on the next slide, so just bear with me for a moment. Um, the site plan on the left is the site plan that was circulated to the public in October. Um, the Rapid Housing Initiative announcement was made during that public consultation stage of the planning application, and the funds came with certain conditions that required the original proposal to be redesigned. The original submission contemplated the retention of much of the existing building and the addition of three more buildings to the site. The revised proposal is on the right hand side of the screen, and this design takes into account not only the RHI conditions, but also public and staff feedback. So the building will now be of a modular construction. Um, the existing building will be removed entirely. The number of units has decreased slightly from 26 to 25 units, and the height of the proposed residential buildings has decreased from three stories to two stories. And the site will now have a designated smoking area to reduce smoking in the neighborhood. Slide 20, please. So as mentioned, this is just a close up of the original and the revised site plan. The applicant is going to go over the site plan in more detail during their portion of tonight's presentation, but very briefly, it's six buildings, five of which are residential and are two stories in height and one building for the center operations, which is one story. The parking is located along the southern property line. 
the area for the waste containers has been moved further from the street right of way than where it's, where it's situated currently. And the development is organized in a courtyard style form with amenity area as shown. Slide 21, please. So in terms of the approach we took with this application, it was originally an application to amend 2002 development agreement, and there were some challenges with that. The 2002 agreement was structured in such a way that it limited the number of people that could reside in the facility to 20, and it limited the built form to what was shown on the site plan and elevation drawings. And this is a completely valid planning approach. It's worked well for this property up until this point. But the agreement is almost 19 years old and our standardized language that we use in development agreements has evolved since then. So we found ourselves in a position where um, an amendment was more administratively cumbersome than starting with a fresh agreement. So the approach we used for this proposal was a new de development agreement, um, which defines a developable area on the site where development must be located, which essentially retains the rest of the site as a non-disturbance area and it puts in place text provisions to control the built form. So the benefit of this approach is that it provides flexibility in case something unexpected comes up and a further design refinement is required. We won't have to go back and amend this development agreement. Slide 22, please. So this slide contains an overview of some of the key aspects of the proposed development agreement. I talked about the developable area. It provides a good separation from residential development adjacent to the northern portion of the property. The development agreement does allow for more than one building on a lot, and this allows the campus style format. Um, the agreement requires the development to adhere to the R2 zoning standards in terms of setback lot coverage and maximum height. And because we didn't try to strictly control the architecture of the development, we introduced landscaping measures that would assist with the buffering of the development from the homes opposite on Greenhead Road. So all these provisions seek to respond to the policy criteria that deal with scale and design and compatibility with existing neighborhood form and the provision for a designated smoking area responds to the policy criteria to consider on site features required for facility users. Slide 23 please. So this development agreement does contain a few non-substantive amendments, and that's an amendment that can be made by community council at a future date without a formal public hearing. The DA lists changes to the developable area, changes to the accessory building requirements, changes to the sign requirements, and extensions to the date of commencement of up to two years. Slide 24, please. So as notice of motion was given for this application on December 9th, 2020, it's staff's recommendation that Halifax and West Community Council approve the proposed development agreement as set out in attachment A of the staff report dated November 26, 2020, approve the discharge of the existing development agreement as set out in attachment B of the staff report, and require the proposed development agreement and the discharge agreement be signed by the property owner within 240 days. Slide 25, please. This concludes staff's presentation. Thank you. Great, thank you, Jacqueline. Any questions and clarification from members at all? Seeing none, um, I will now ask Adrian Sala. I hope uh, I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, please forgive me if I am to press star six to unmute yourself. Adrian, are you there? Hello? Hi, we can hear you. Oh, no, Hello? now we can't. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we got you. Thank you for joining us this evening. Great, yeah, thanks so much, Mr. Chair and council members and staff for having us here. Um, my name is Adrian Sala, and I'm a planner at the Affordable Housing Association, and I am here on behalf of ADSEN for Women and Children uh, to present their planning application at 158 Greenhead Road, and then I'll be joined by Sherry Lecker, the Executive Director of ADSEN, to address any questions or concerns that the public or council might have. Um, okay, great. Two, Thank you. Oh. So you, you, have, you have 10 minutes. Start, no, that's fine. You have okay. 10 minutes. Uh, thank you. And I do, is there a presentation? Yes. Yeah, I do have a presentation. Okay. So when you when your your when your PowerPoint's up, just tell the the, oh. the clerk to move your slide uh, when you want to move it, and that way they'll know to to move on. Great. 
is the slide up? Yep, so we have first slide up on slide one. Okay, great. I'll just move to slide two then immediately. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to give a bit of a, a history or an overview of Adson and their experience in housing. Um, adson has been providing a safe place for women in HRM since 1983. Since opening its doors, the organization has grown from one emergency shelter to operating eight locations, which offer a range of housing types and supports for residents. Adson recognizes the vital need for emergency and transitional housing, but to end someone's experience of homelessness, we need housing that is safe, of good quality, affordable, and permanent. Um, so Adson has gained experience purchasing land, demolishing derelict buildings, and overseeing new construction and major retrofit projects. They developed Adson Court in Dartmouth, and in 2012, the Alders on Godgen Street in Halifax, which is the building featured on slide two. They also own condominium units in Clayton Park that are rented to single mother-led families. Adson also rents multiple locations. Up to 10 apartments function as emergency housing for families to avoid shelters, and in the past year, it has developed a shared housing model for 10 people. In other words, Adson sees himself as a progressive and engaged organization exploring different solutions because they acknowledge there's no one-size-fits-all for folks who experience homelessness. Today, the organization owns and manages 53 units of permanent and transitional housing, one emergency shelter with 17 beds, and rents and manages 10 units for adults and 10 for families. All their units are rent geared to income and their efforts are focused on increasing the supply of safe, affordable, and financially sustainable housing throughout HRM. Slide three, please. Um, so Adson received the existing structure, uh, what was an old elementary school, through HRM's Community Interest Surplus category in 2001. Since then, um, the location has offered transitional housing with supports for residents, which range with a range of programming, including groups for therapeutic change, life skills management, and parenting, among others. The program was originally designed for three to six month stays. However, in the past few years, residents have struggled to find affordable housing in the private market to move on to. So their stays at the transitional units have been much longer than originally anticipated. Slide four, please. Um, so this slide just provides an overview of kind of where the project has come from and where we are today. Um, so when the national housing strategy was announced in 2017, the federal government rolled out several programs and initiatives available to community housing providers. Um, in 2019, Adson began working with AHAMS to explore feasible expansion opportunities for the project due to the vast size of the site and the opportunity for future development. Um, and also that Adson has had a presence in the community for almost two decades uh, and the center is very successful with their tenants. We submitted our planning application in June 2020 and public consultation, as Jacqueline mentioned, began in October. In November 2020, the Rapid Housing Initiative was announced and with the help of our design team, Adson successfully adapted the original site plan to the new one to meet the funding requirements that were announced. The proposal arrived at Halifax and West Community Council on December 9th and motion for the public hearing, which is where we are today. Um, if successful, Adson does have a plan to start construction by March 2021 and complete the project by March 2022 to be in line with the Rapid Housing Initiative requirements. Slide five, please. So as Jacqueline mentioned, Adson's site plan did evolve to adapt to the new requirements of the Rapid Housing Initiative and also to meet public uh, feedback. However, we believe the essence of the plan has remained the same and only improved to better fit community and tenant needs. Um, in response to community fee get feedback, um, we did incorporate footpaths uh, that divert foot traffic away from homes directly adjacent to the center, so we which is seen between buildings A and F and labeled as number one on the site plan. Um, we included a landscaped area at the front of the property to respect the privacy of neighboring properties, um, which is labeled as number two on the site plan. We did incorporate a designated smoking area and positioned it at building C, so as far away from the street as possible, um, and it's labeled as number three on the site plan. And then we enclosed the garbage and moved it away from the street next to building A so that it's not visible from the street um, and adjacent properties, and it's labeled as number four. We also believe that permanent housing will give tenants more privacy and space in the current transitional housing. Permanent dwellings give tenants the opportunity to host guests and have a sense of ownership and pride in their home that's not possible given transitional housing where all living spaces are shared. 
Additionally, ADSIM also adapted their site plan to the rapid housing initiative, as was mentioned. Um, the entire development or all the residential units will be modularly built. Um, we've developed a realistic plan to complete the project by March 2022 and have full occupancy of all 25 units by that date. And we've adapted the affordability levels in the financial performa. Additionally, although the Rapid Housing Initiative does not require high levels of accessibility and energy efficiency, ADSEN chose to incorporate progressive levels for both criteria. Uh, four units will be fully accessible to the Nova Scotia Building Code requirements, which exceed the accessibility standards by double. And with the help of local architects at Passive Design Solutions, we have incorporated passive design principles that will result in a reduction in operational energy consumption of approximately 65% based on our most recent energy modeling. We're also working with local landscape architects and designers of play um, to develop a state-of-the-art accessible playscape and outdoor space for the families, which is located on the site plan between building B and S and labeled as number five. Due to the modular design and development, the development went from three stories down to two, which is less dense and better suits the surrounding community. It also repositions the new one-story community space in Building A as a transition between the two-story residential units and the adjacent properties, which is labeled as number six on the site plan. As I've mentioned, ADSEN has been a part of this community for almost two decades and is com committed to working with neighbors to address any concerns or questions that may arise. When we began to, heard the, began to hear about the public feedback through HRM staff, we decided to circulate the program coordinator's contact information to all respondents to create to open a door of communication and staff will continue to be accessible. Slide six, please. We wanted to provide council with a vision of the housing that could be developed in the site to help imagine what is possible. This is only a preliminary design, but a demonstration of what ADSIM wants to achieve on the site. ADSIM is very excited about this project and is very proud of, as to how far they have come. It will be a game changer for women, families, and gender non-conforming folks to enjoy quality housing that is built for the future. It will be sustainable, beautiful, and a demonstration of what is possible. Slide seven, please. So thank you so much for having us here. We're very excited, and I will be joined by Sherry Lecker for any questions or comments. Thank you so much. Thank you, Adrienne and Sherry, for joining us. Uh, any questions of clarification from members of council? Seeing none, I'll open the public hearing. Uh, so we have two members who have signed up previously on the date, 4.30, the previous business day prior to the hearing. Uh, first is Curtis Raffuse, and the number two is Deborah Moreau, I believe, uh, to speak. And we'll start with uh, Mr. Refuge and again, star six to unmute yourself and you have five minutes. Good evening, can you hear me? We got you, welcome again. Thank you very much, Council, again. For, for record, my name is Curtis Refuge. I reside at 119 Greenhead Road which I've been here for 12 years. I have no problems with the Adam Center expanding because we do not have enough space for the homeless now. Um, I've seen a lot of their ideas and it looks good to me. The only thing that I haven't seen is the size and the construction of the Green Hit Road itself. I drive this regularly. I've been doing it for 12 years. It's dangerous. It's not wide enough. There's no sidewalks and you want to bring, God love them, you want to bring children into the community, which is great. But I think you should just think about that and maybe add something in because it's great to bring them here, but we certainly don't want to see them getting injured because of the roads. And I have heard nothing other than good things, but you have said nothing about this road that I have seen. I think that's about what I, all I want to say, um, there shouldn't be a problem other than that. Great, anybody, thank you. Has anybody looked into that? Well, what we'll do, is, and, and thank you for that, what we'll do is we'll, at the end, we'll take these comments and either the applicant or staff can 
can uh, provide some feedback uh, once once we're done. So we'll we'll make sure that your your question if it's not answered tonight, we'll we'll get addressed in some way. Thank you. And about the people hanging out and being around, I'm on the lower end down on the property. I'm not up on the upper end, and I've had no problems with that. I just okay. want to speak on that on this lower end. All right. Thank you again. Uh, we appreciate you joining us. Uh, and if that's it. That's that is th that is it. Thank you again. OK, counsel. thank you, Mr. Um, and now we have Deborah Moreau. Star six to Hello. You. Hi, yeah, we can hear you. Great. Oh, great. Uh, good evening. I would just like to share my thoughts as a resident of At Atsum. I live in uh, Atsum Court in Dartmouth. Um, I, we're in the middle of a housing crisis right now, and women are most vulnerable. Atsum for Women and Children provides affordable, safe, and secure housing, plus support, a supportive environment. Um, with counselors and social workers always available, I don't have to go through life alone anymore. Uh, Adsum has always had and continues to have my best interest at heart. I can sleep peacefully at night with the knowledge that I will not wake up one morning to the eviction, to an eviction notice saying my place has been sold. If I hadn't found the supportive, affordable housing opportunity given to me by Atsum, I would have continued to struggle with mental health issues and homelessness. I'm sure of that. Without this kind of support, the cycle of homelessness continues. For 60 years, I, I had never known what it was like to feel safe, secure, and content. Now at 65 years of age, I want to be here and I want to be happy, and I am happy and content, and I want to live. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts and feelings with you tonight, and that's pretty much all I have to say. Hello? Oh, yeah, sorry, my mute my mute wouldn't come off. Uh, thank you, oh, okay. thank you, Deborah. <laughs> uh, thank you, Deborah, for joining us tonight and, and sharing that. Uh, we appreciate it. You're welcome, and thank you for hearing me. So Bye -bye. that is it for no, thank you. Uh, that is it for registered speakers uh, that that signed up for tonight. So I'll give Adrian a moment to rebuttal any comments that that she heard or any feedback she'd like to close the hearing with hello yep hi we can hear you oh not anymore star six to unmute yourself Sorry about that. I think we have you again. Can you Possibly? hear me now? Yes, we got you. Great. Okay, great. Yeah, no, I was just saying thank you so much. We have nothing else to say, but thank you so much for the folks who called in and for council to hear our application. All right, thank you. Um, um, with that, uh, I ask for a motion to close the public hearing. So moved, Councilor Cleary. Second, okay. Councilor Mason. All right, moved by Councilor Clear, second by Councilor Mason. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Aye. Seeing none, uh, public hearing is now closed. Uh, thank you, colleagues. And if there's any uh, clarification that members would like to ask from staff, uh, we can ask those questions once we uh, put the motion on the floor, which I will go to Councilor Stoddard to do that. You're on mute. <laughs> Caught me. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd like to move that Halifax and West Community Council approve the proposed development agreement, which shall be substantially in this of the same form as set out in attachment A 
approve by resolution the discharge agreement, which shall be substantially of the same form as set out in attachment B of the staff report dated November 26, 2020, and require the development agreement and discharge agreement to be signed by the property owner within 240 days or any extension thereof granted by council on request of the property owner from the date of final approval by council or any other bodies as necessary, including applicable appeal periods, which whichever is later. Otherwise, this approval will be void and obligations arising herein shall be at an end. I so move. Second by Councillor Cuddle, thank you. Um, Councillor Stoddard, any any comments at all? Um, I'm very much in favor of this um, home. I think it is necessary and it is affordable and for women and children that are um, in situations that they can't um, get affordable housing. This will be a nice transitional place for them. And if they need to stay longer, um, I understand that they can. Um, I really, I approve this development. I think it's a great idea and I'm glad they can take um, advantage of the funding that's available. Great, thank you, Councillor. Any uh, further comments from members? Councillor Cuddle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, first, I'd like to thank Cliff and Deborah for taking the time to come and share their thoughts about this project with us. And um, it's great to have some public at our public hearings um, even through this online format. Um, I, I just want to say uh, how thoughtful this plan is and how impressed I am with those involved in it to listen deeply to what the neighbors had to say, um, respond with a design that um, respected those comments. And you know, honestly, when I look at when I look at this site plan, um, I think what an improvement it is going to be for this for this lot and and for this area, and what a wonderful place it will be for those who are able to reside there. Um, you know, I this this housing is is as we know um, desperately needed in our city and. I just want to say that I fully support um, this project moving forward. So thank you to everyone involved for your great work, um, staff and at some house. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Cleary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and, and my colleagues and uh, the folks who came out and spoke and especially the applicant. Uh, it's a fantastic project and I, I can't wait to see it get off the ground. Um, I have never been out this way, so I actually went to Google Earth, of course, and I uh, did a virtual walk down Greenhead. And uh, it, it, at first I had to go look at, at the ownership of it because I wasn't sure it was a real road. It, it's really just a driveway that looks like it's going into a mobile home park. Uh, but it is actually a road. Uh, it narrows significantly once you get into it um, and there's if you go to the Google Earth images, people walking their dogs just on the edge of the corner. So I think Mr. Rafew's uh, comments about the road itself, uh, you know, may, maybe could use some improvements uh, in, the, in the near future as many of our roads could. So I just want to thank Mr. Rafew's for uh, bringing up those comments um, because I, uh, re regardless of whether you're adding more people to this area, it's a pretty low density area, granted. Uh, and I'm sure it's very safe to walk on the road. Uh, but it sure would be nice to see maybe a paved shoulder and, uh, you know, uh, if not a real sidewalk, at least a functioning sidewalk in there. So I'm looking at you, Councillor Stoddard. Get your work cut out for you. <laughs> Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, and I don't see anyone else on the speakers list. So really quickly, I'll just say again, thank you to everyone that came spoke on the subject and the applicant and I, as, as Councillor Cuddle mentioned, I do apply the applicant for look, taking the feedback that they heard from residents and incorporating it into the application. And, you know, that is just uh, a, a small version of how Adsum Health does listen to neighbors and does work with those neighbors. And, you know, I'm fortunate to have 
Atom Health in my district, and, and they've always been good neighbors and uh, good advocates for those who are most in need, and even those who are not, just always good neighbors in general. So this is just another application to show that they, they do great work, and I also support this and will call for the question. Question has been called. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those Aye. opposed? Seeing none, that passes. Uh, thank you, colleagues and staff and the applicants and yeah. members of the public. All right, so moving on to our last, before I say that, yes, the last item of the evening, um, which is, oh, my computer's freaking out. Sorry, which is uh, item, uh, which is a variance hearing, um, item 5.2.1, case 23041 and 23042, appeal of variance refusal 5856 and 5964. Uh, Akasti Drive, help me, I always pr pronounce this incorrectly. What's the correct pronouncing? Akasti, help me out. I, I'm, it's been a long day. Uh, I apologize, colleagues. <laughs> uh, Halifax. Um, so we have Matthew, Rosemary, and Aaron McIntyre here tonight, and I believe, Matthew, you are the one presenting um, this evening. And uh, before we go to the presentation, I'll just speak about the rules. Um, again, you were here for variance uh, hearing for 5956 and 5964. Um, uh, and Maca oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, and Macos Drive. I need some uh, tea. Thank you. So thank you for joining us. We have we have no speakers who are registered to speak this evening, and the time to uh, register was five or four thirty the previous business day uh, of the hearing. Uh, so we will have a presentation from staff and then go to members of the community council for any clarification, and then we will go to the applicant which right now we have Mr. John Risley and Mr. Stephen Adams who are here to speak uh, on behalf of the applicant. So I'll pass it on to Matthew who will give the staff presentation. Perfect, uh, just to start off, can everyone hear me okay? Fantastic, thumbs up. Okay, good evening chair and members of council. My name is Matthew Conlon, planner one with land development and subdivision in HRM's planning department. Uh, this evening, I'll be presenting case 23041 and 23042, the appeal of a variance request associated with a reduction in side yard setbacks, which was refused at Civic 5956 and 5964 Emscote Drive in the south end of Halifax. Next slide, please. Um, so as a bit of background, uh, both properties are zoned R1 under the Halifax Peninsula Land Use Bylaw and are under the South End Secondary Plan Subarea 3. The two lots are adjacent to each other, sharing a common side yard boundary line. Both lots are owned by the same property owner, the applicant for these two variance cases. As a quick bit of history on these lots, construction permits were requested and issued to construct a new single unit dwelling on each lot. The construction permit for Civic 5964 was issued in 2014 and all work has been completed. The permit to construct a single unit dwelling on Civic 5956 was, is, was issued in 2017 and some work is still ongoing. The applicant has now requested a construction permit for each lot to put an addition onto the side of each existing single unit dwelling to a zero foot side yard setback. This proposed addition would create an internal corridor which meets at the shared lot line, allowing an individual access from one dwelling to the other completely internally. The proposed additions to each dwelling would not meet the yard requirements of the land use bylaw, specifically the side yard setbacks. In order to facilitate this proposal, a variance has been requested. Planning staff reviewed these two variance requests and deemed it violated the intent of the land use bylaw, resulting in the variances being refused. The applicant has appealed the refusal from planning staff, which has prompted this evening's appeal case. A staff report was created, which outlines all the details around these variance cases and refusal. And I'll go into more detail about some of those in uh, just a little bit. Next slide, please. 
So this image provides some broad context for the location of the two lots, which are contained within the black box on the left hand side of the image. Civic 5956 is highlighted with the red outline and shaded in, and Civic 5964 is the next lot to the left. Point Pleasant Park can be seen in green on this map. The majority of neighborhoods in this area are zoned R1, and these two specific properties also have water frontage on the northwest arm. Next slide, please. Now zoomed into the two subject properties, shaded in black and gray, Civic 5956 is on the right, which is case 23042, and Civic 5964 is on the left, which is case 23041. The thick black line surrounding the neighborhood indicates the 100 meter radius for the area of notification for all properties in the area that received a mail out regarding this variance appeal. And this mail out included 41 different properties. Next slide, please. Uh, the specific variance requested for these sites is a reduction in a side yard setback from the minimum required six feet down to zero feet. As previously indicated, putting an addition onto each single unit dwelling with zero feet of setback from the side lot line is not permitted by the land use bylaw, and therefore the variances were requested. Next slide, please. Uh, this site plan shows the two existing single unit dwellings found on the lots with the proposed addition to each dwelling highlighted in black and gray shading. Without the proposed additions on each dwelling, both Civic 5956 and 5964 meet all the requirements of the land use bylaw. Next slide, please. So the following slides will provide a little bit of uh, better image and context for the proposed additions to each dwelling. This first image that we're looking at shows the front view of Civic 5964. This is the north elevation, meaning we're standing on Emscote Drive, looking at the front of the building. The northwest arm would be situated behind the dwelling from this vantage point. The red bubble in the center of your screen highlights the proposed addition onto the existing dwelling. The drawing also indicates the existing and proposed portions of the dwelling, and the grayed out building on the left side of this image illustrates the neighboring dwelling at 5956 Emscote Drive. The lot line separating the two properties is also indicated in the middle of the image with a broken or dashed vertical black line, and the proposed connection of the two dwellings would have a partition wall and door at the connection of these two additions at the shared lot line. Next slide, please. So we're now looking at uh, the same building, Civic 5964 from the rear yard now facing southward. Uh, now this, the northwest arm is behind us and on the other side of the dwelling would be Emscote Drive. Again, the proposed addition to the dwelling is showing within the red bubble on the center of the image and the adjoining addition from Civic 5956 can now be seen within the grayed out portion on the right hand side. Next slide, please. And finally, from this vantage point, we're looking east with the northwest arm on your left hand side and Emscote Drive on your right. Uh, the internal passageway is illustrated in the center of the image, showing the proposed connection between the two dwellings. So essentially, we're standing on the neighboring property and we're looking down the center of the proposed addition, which would be the internal connection there. Next slide, please. And now we see the same front elevation now showing the existing dwelling at 5956 Emscote Drive. As previously indicated in the presentation and on these plans, you can see that some portion of the dwelling is still under construction. However, the plans still show what is existing or to be built under the existing construction permit that was already issued, as well as the portion proposed as an addition, which is a 12 foot section. Civic 5964 is now grayed out on the plans and it's on the right hand side. Next slide, please. Again, we're now looking southward and we're now on the rear yard of Civic 5956 with the northwest arm behind us once again and Emscote Drive is in front of us on the other side of the dwelling. And the next slide, please. Again, we are looking at the side perspective and we're now looking down the proposed corridor connecting Civic 5956 to 5964, again highlighted in red for you. Next slide, please. So uh, this is an image of the site as it exists today. It was taken earlier this month. Civic 5964 is on the right and 5956 is on the left. 
the graphs and the railing that you see on the left hand side shows essentially the extent of Civic 5956, 5956's structure with the common lot line located within the middle of the open space between the two dwellings where you can uh, currently see the northwest arm in the background there. And if we go to the next slide, uh, what you can now see is um, an image that the applicant has provided, which is a rendering to illustrate how the proposed additions would look if the variants were to be accepted. You can see the connecting um, passageway where um, just in the background there where we used to be able to see the northwest arm. Next slide, please. So for a variance request to be refused, at least one of the following three criteria must be observed. Uh, a would be the variance violates the intent of the land use bylaw. B, the difficulty experienced is general to the properties in the area. Or C, the difficulty experienced results from an intentional disregard for the requirements of the land use bylaw. As outlined in the staff report, it was determined the variance, pardon me, the request violates the intent of the land use bylaw and the difficulty experienced is general to the properties in the area. So to provide a little bit more context into that, we'll go through it one by one. First of all, to do with the intent of the land use bylaw. The bylaw for Halifax Peninsula requires a minimum side yard setback of 10% of the lot width to a maximum of six feet within the R1 zone. The two subject properties are greater than 60 feet in width, which would result in a minimum side yard setback of six feet. These setback requirements are in place for both aesthetic and practical reasons. Zones within the land use bylaw stipulate minimum setbacks for development from the front, the side and the rear property lines and minimum side yard setbacks are provided for adequate separation from neighboring structures and allow for privacy access around the building and consistent visual makeup within the neighborhoods. Section 10 subsection 1 of the land use bylaw does state that in no case shall there be more than one building on one lot or one building on more than one lot except as otherwise provided in the bylaw. There are no provisions within the land use bylaw that would provide an exception to section 10 subsection 1 to allow for consideration of the proposal outside of the variance process. The proposed developments meet all the requirements of the land use bylaw. Well, it's technically possible to comply with the building code as it pertains to a connection between two dwellings and enclosed corridor between the two dwellings separated with the partition wall and code compliant doorway on the common property boundary uh, results in what could be considered as a single building on more than one lot. The zoning in the area limits the permitted land use to single unit dwellings only. While individually the proposed structures technically satisfy the requirements, the proposed adjacency of the two buildings effectively results in two dwelling units contained within what would appear to be a single structure. Staff believe that outcome would be inconsistent with the intent of the land use bylaw. Noting all these factors, it's the development officer's opinion that this proposal violates the intent of the land use bylaw. Uh, looking now at difficulty general to the properties in the area, the average lot width on Emscote Drive is approximately 119 feet. Therefore, most lots in the area have a minimum six foot side yard setback requirement consistent with the lots in question. The subject lots are 45,017 square feet, which would be Civic 5964, and 42,900 square feet, which is Civic 5956. And the average size of the lots in the area is approximately 16,300 square feet. The lots requesting variants are the largest in the neighborhood and are close to or larger than the average lot width. These conditions result in ample opportunity for development in accordance with the land use bylaw and in compliance with the minimum side yard regulations. Furthermore, there would not appear to be any physical or topographical constraints on the subject properties that would result in difficulties that would require relaxation of the side yard requirements to allow appropriate development to proceed. Uh, therefore, the difficulty being experienced in this case is related to the bylaws limitation on the applicant's desire to utilize the two dwellings as a single structure. In the context of this difficulty and noting the capacity for compliant development outlined above, it's the development officer's opinion that the dif difficulty is general to the properties in the area and also to all R1 zone properties in the plan area. 
uh, it should be noted intentional disregard was not a consideration for this application. The applicant has followed the correct process. Next slide, please. Therefore, the alternatives before Council are as follows. Council may overturn the decision of the development officer and allow the appeal. This would allow for the construction of the additions as the applicant has proposed, or Council may uphold the development officer's decision and deny the appeal. This is the recommended alternative. This concludes my presentation. Staff are available for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, any questions of clarification from members of Community Council? Um, seeing none on the chat, I can't see head nod. Yeah. Oh, yep, yeah, all right, here we go. Now I can see you guys. Councilor Cuddle. Sorry, I couldn't uh, find my mute button there or any of my panel. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I just have one question for staff. Um, just around the the concept of the um, a, whether this is a general difficulty to properties in the neighborhood. Um, could you just explain a little bit more about what you mean by that and how you came to that conclusion? Certainly. So uh, in general terms, uh, what we're looking for is, is there a constraint that all um, properties in the area have that is similar? So simply put, uh, if everyone has very small lots and someone is saying, um, we would like to be able to build on this lot, but go beyond the regular requirements because our lot is, is quite small. What we'd be looking at is, is this difficulty being a very small or a very narrow lot um, consistent and, and, and found quite generally in all of the area, at which point if the answer is yes, that basically all lots in the area are extremely narrow, then that would be deemed to be a difficulty experience that's general to the properties. Uh, essentially saying that the variance request is, is not one that is uh, unique to one property. So more specifically to your question of these two properties, um, the difficulty experienced when trying to um, delineate uh, whether a side yard setback should be reduced, normally staff are looking at um, why is it that we need, why is it that a, a request for a reduced side yard setback has been, um, has been proposed? In this one, there is a bit of a more unique circumstance that the two lots are commonly owned and the intention is to provide a connection between the two lots. Uh, however, when looking at it more broadly, um, the fact that all lots are in the area um, are essentially the same size, the same width, uh, that's where we came to our conclusion that the, uh, ex the difficulty experience would be general to the area as all lots are effectively the same size. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Any further comments or questions from members? Seeing none. All right, so I will ask our ap applicant Appealant, sorry, um, John Risley and Stephen Adam to press star six to unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me, Mr. Can you hear me, Mr. Chair? Uh, yes, I can. Thank you for joining us this evening. No, not at all. Uh, thank you, and um, thank you to uh, council members for giving me this opportunity, and thank you to uh, uh, Matthew. Um, for what quite a complex presentation. I must say, I live here and I was confused by all the various drawings that he was taking us through. I was trying to figure out what was what. Uh, I'm sure you were similarly confused. Um, look, I think some background here would be, would be very helpful uh, to you. So if I may, I'd like to provide you with that background. We always uh, wanted to have a, a single family house here, i.e. A, a, a house in which we would we would be able to live without having to travel outdoors. And um, the circumstances were that uh, uh, the, the one lot, 5964 Emscote, became available 
we bought that property. We knew the neighbors, uh, the, the house next door. We knew that they wanted to sell. They were an older couple, and they just explained to us that they weren't ready to sell at the time, but they had every intention of selling and were happy to sell to us. So we designed uh, the property as, as you see it on, on the slide that Matthew showed you and uh, went ahead and proceeded with the construction on the, on the 5964 side, the, the northern uh, house, and uh, we live there uh, now today. And then uh, the folks next door and did, did, indeed did move, and we, we uh, started construction of, the, of, the, of that house. And the, the sort of purpose of the two houses was one was going to be sort of a, a house um, uh, with teenagers and and uh, friends and and the, the the sort of house to the to the south um, or the property to the south or that end of the house was going to be for uh, uh, generally entertaining. Uh, I I do a lot of fundraising work and 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 have customers in town from time to time, and uh, I like to entertain people at home and. Um, and uh, this was going to be a way to do that in a what what we thought would be a very idyllic setting, and so we we had uh, a kitchen in in each of the two um, uh, uh, properties, and and uh, we had built a house back in the early 1990s on Thornvale Avenue, which is not far away, and and at, at that time there was no problem with having a house with two kitchens, and we had we built two kitchens in that house, so it never occurred to us as we were proceeding uh, down this path uh, that we would be offending any of the city's uh, bylaws or restrictions by having a single family house with new, two kitchens because we already had one. So uh, what happened was in the event as, as the second house was sort of proceeding or the second property was proceeding, if you like, uh, I'm just confusing you by calling them two houses when it's really, we're trying to make it one here. Um, um, we uh, uh, we went to the city and said, "Look, okay, we we're, we'll consolidate the two lots, and um, and uh, and in fact, um, you know, staff recommended that that would be the alternative. And then they, when they looked at the plans, they said, "Oh, well, you've got a, a kitchen, uh, you've got two kitchens, and you can't have two kitchens, so you can't consolidate." So, uh, Jeepers, we were <laughs> left then with a bit of a head scratcher, and I must say that that staff were very helpful and, and cooperative and and said, well, look, the only way you're going to be able to do this and to retain the two kitchens um, is to is to get a variance of the uh, of the of the setback thing me Bob so that you can you can build this 12 foot section that will will connect the two houses and you have to put a firewall in and, and so on, which we are obviously happy to do. And uh, um, so that that effectively is the only option. I mean, if if you were to for some reason say no to our request, then then we would have to consolidate the properties, and so we could build this unit. We would have to go to great expense to tear out one of the kitchens, which is obviously not something we want to do. And and then we wouldn't be able to use the the property as we had intended it because we'd only have one kitchen. Um, and as I say, we, one, we wanted one kitchen to be very informal and another kitchen to be uh, much more formal in terms of, it, of its use. So we've, um, we've been to all our neighbors, uh, well, all the neighbors that are physically contiguous, and you saw a sort of a plan of, of those that we had to go to. And we actually wrote to them two years ago when we started this process, and we had no objections from our neighbors then. And um, and um, so I and I hate sort of banging on somebody's door and imposing myself on them. But at any rate, I, I we did that, and um, and and I think all of them who are physically contiguous have sent in letters to um, the clerk's office saying that they support what it is that uh, we're trying to do. So um, on, on that note, I'm not sure that, that any, there is anything else I can, I can add. As I say, we didn't set out to, to violate any, uh, any bylaws and, and we're apologetic for the fact that we've imposed all, this, all, this, uh, all these issues and hassle on, on city staff. And, um, um, uh, and I know ignorance of the law is no excuse, but, but hopefully you'll understand why we, why we found ourselves in this position. 
and, and hopefully we're able to generate uh, your sympathy. So on that note, um, I'm happy to take anybody's questions. Thank you, Mr. Risley, and, and that is time. So I will uh, allow any members of community council to ask any questions of clarification if they have any for you. And we'll just give a second for those who might just waiting for the presentation to come off the screen so I can see members or just write in the chat uh, if you have any questions for Mr. Risley. So I'm seeing no questions for you, Mr. Risley, and we have no one that's registered to speak. So um, there's no opportunity for you to rebuttal, uh, no, no speaker. Um, so with that, we thank you for joining us this evening and um, we'll, we'll close the public hearing. Uh, and I ask- Variance yeah, hearing. Or sorry, variance, variance hearing. So the variance hearing moved Second. by Councilor Mason. Seconded by Councilor Cleary. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. All opposed? Seeing none. All right. So the public hearing is now closed. Thank you to uh, Mr. Risley again. Um, so with that closed, uh, I will ask if the, the solicitor, um, just for clarification on how the motion has to be put on the floor and how we do this tonight, could just give a quick brief under, uh, understanding of how the variance hearings work. Because this is always one that we, we get convoluted. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Meg Rittigal, solicitor here. Uh, so just for a bit of a review, uh, this is the appeal of a refusal of two variance requests. Uh, there has been a notice of the hearing to the parties in advance and access to all the material provided to council. Uh, there has been a presentation by staff and the appellant. As this is a case of a refusal of a variance, the appellant, only the appellant and any people uh, allowed that were received notice were allowed to speak. Uh, no one else had registered for this hearing. After the submissions have been heard, council must place a motion of allow the appeal on the floor. Allowing the appeal will allow the variance and overturn the decision of the development officer. Denial of the appeal results in the denial of the variance. Great, thank you very much. And I will now give the floor to Councillor Mason, who will put on the motion. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I move as for Administrative Order 1, Section 58, that Halifax and West Community Council allow the appeal. I so move. Moved by Councillor Mason. Second, Cleary. Uh, by Councillor Cleary. Councillor Mason. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. So, uh, and uh, thank you to Legal for that clarification. Um, we put the affirmative motion on the floor to the new councillors because in the event of a tie, a tie fails. So if you put a negative motion on the floor and there's a tie, you would fail into a yes, if you follow that math. So uh, we can talk about that later over coffee. Uh, so I'm going to ask council to vote against the appeal and support the decision of the development officer. And I'm gonna tell you why I, I feel we have to do that. Um, what we're doing here today, as, as staff said, is we're looking at uh, whether a variance um, uh, should be granted or not. And a variance may not be granted if it violates the intent of the land use bylaw, that's A, or B, uh, the difficulty the experience is general to the properties in the area. I think staff did a good job of explaining that the, 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 the intention is to have a single uh, property, a single building on each property in this zone, according to the land use bylaw, with a side yard, and that that is everywhere in the R1 and R2 zones in the Penn Center and, and probably in all of, uh, or in the peninsula and probably in, in all of HRM. I think the part that I really want to emphasize though, especially for our new councillors, is section 2521 of the charter says, where council hears an appeal for from the granting of a refusal or a variance, council may make any decision the development officer could have made. So we are bound by the same rules in the charter that the development officer is bound by. Uh, so we have to, we, our job as in this quasi-judicial quasi role is to act as a judge and to measure whether or not those criteria are there. And if they are, then we cannot grant the, the variance. So uh, the arguments we've heard tonight uh, and that we saw in writing from the uh, appellant who is a you know major contributor to the community and I, I hear his arguments, but the proposals, uh, the fact that uh, the proposal is that two kitchens are needed and that it doesn't inconvenience the neighbors and we receive those letters, that it should be allowed. 
those arguments don't really, to me, have any standing in law. It's simply not how variances work. The appellant needs to show that the request meets one of the standards in Section 2503. So another argument is that this is a unique situation, and this is where it really hits home to me because of what of other issues we face on the peninsula, especially in the South End around the universities. I put it to you that it is simply not reasonable to believe this is a unique set of circumstances, and even if it was a reason, even if it was, uh, that isn't a reason to grant a variance. Uh, it, but it most assuredly is not. I could imagine large families, daycares, group homes, religious orders, property owners wanting to run private university dorm rooms. That's one that's actually happened, by the way, or any other folks with two adjacent homes who would want to connect these homes. There's nothing unique about having two homes side by side that are not allowed to connect that have to have side yards. Uh, so this is not allowed because in a residential area, you are to build according to the rules of land use bylaw, which require side yards, one home per property and limited bedrooms, which has been a big issue in the university area. Uh, and all this is for the good of the community. So I was reminded recently that the core reason to have variance at all is so council can address hardship. And we've had those even like we've actually had those right just down just uh, down the arm from from the appellant's house. Uh, there was a fellow who had a property and the grade of the property, the road in front of the property was about 45 degrees and you just couldn't build a house on that slope uh, without giving them a variance. It was uh, to replace the house that was already there. Uh, so uh, you know, it is impossible to create rules as a municipality that do not uh, sometimes create unique situations that were not anticipated. But this is not the case in this situation. It is not a hardship that is unique to the appellant owning two houses side by side and wishing to connect them. Uh, so uh, if we don't like these rules, and maybe we don't, we need to have a public process to change the land use bylaw rather than allow a variance under these circumstances. So I will ask council to reject the appeal and support the decision of the development officer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Mason. Uh, Councilor Cleary. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I'm going to take an almost 180 degree uh, view from Councilor Mason. In fact, I don't think we need to change the rules. I think the rules are clear and, and Mr. Conlon explained them. His interpretation as a development officer could be different from a different development officers. It could be different from community council acting as a development officer. Um, so when you look at the two rules violate uh, that are called into question, you're violating the intention of the land use bylaw and general to the area. So violating the intention of the land use bylaw, single lot, two buildings, uh, single structure on two lots, not allowed. Well, one of the things that we just did uh, across the municipality was allow accessory dwelling units. And so we're we're not violating the intent because we actually just updated this. The only thing in question would be then the size of the unit. So this one is obviously going to be larger than the kind of accessory dwelling unit that would be called for in the land use bylaw. So that's a question of size, not a question of intent. The intent is clear. We want more people to be occupying more places. This is a unique area. And when it comes to general to the area, um, there's never been an application like this. It's not about the size of the lot. It's about the the purpose that the the units are being put to. And I would argue that this is so unique that you can't say this is general to any area because it is it's never been done before. It's never been applied for, even that I've been on council in in the years that I've been living in Halifax. Um, we've granted variances for all kinds of things, as Councillor Mason said, uh, just up the arm a little bit further. We allowed someone to connect by breezeway their garage to their house because the setback said if it was attached, if it was a detached garage, it could be closer to the property line if it's a or if it's a detached closer to the property line. If it's a detached garage, it has to be further from the property line. The guy already had the garage built. The neighbor complained about it, and it came to us. And uh, I think it was a, a resident, Mr. Burke. We said, you know what? You're not going to take down the garage because you can leave it there. So we're going to let you build the breezeway between the garage and the house. And so we've actually done almost the exact same thing just up the arm. Uh, we allowed an older gentleman who lived on Micmac to uh, build a garage on top of his driveway, violating the setback. And we said, you know what? It clearly violates all that, but you're an old guy who can't shovel snow anymore. So we're going to let you have the garage you can park your car in right away. Um, you know, I think about front yard setbacks, side yard setbacks, rear yard setbacks. We've granted all kinds of variances in the four years that I've been on council. And in fact, in this particular property, you could bring this breezeway six feet apart uh, or six feet from the property line and stop it there, put two doors and then put a tent around it 
yes. to create the same thing. And that would be stupid. So the idea here, based on, I think, what we have is one of our principles in having public hearings and especially variance hearings is to listen to the community, the neighbors. Why would we have a 100 meter uh, notification area and send out notice say, hey, what do you think about this? If we don't care what they think, all of them, no one objected. Everyone said it's fine by me. So I'm not even sure what the purpose of a, of, of a hearing is if we're not going to listen to the neighbors. And so I believe in democracy and I believe in looking at the rules that we have in, in front of us and interpreting the rules for situations that are in front of us. And I just I don't see how this is. I think we need to allow the appeals. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Cleary. Uh, I will now go to Councillor Cuddle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, actually, uh, I think Sean just answered the question I had for staff, which was around how we got around two kitchens with accessory units. Um, so I'm wondering if that is still the two kitchen rule is still an issue in HRM or does the secondary unit approval of secondary units kind of not make that an issue anymore? Um, so yes, the single kitchen per dwelling is still a standing rule. Um, there's a distinction to be made that a secondary suite um, is an exception to the rule internally. If you are going to put an internal unit in your building, you are permitted to have that suite as long as it meets the requirements, which is a size requirement of generally no more than 80 square meters internally. Or conversely, you could have a backyard suite, which is a completely detached um, dwelling unit, which would again be subject to size requirements. And once again, would mean that an additional dwelling unit on the same lot could have uh, a kitchen within it. At that point, though, if you have a backyard suite, you would still be um, beholden to a single kitchen within your main dwelling. So. Uh, to answer the question as effectively as I can, the backyard and secondary suites do allow for additional units on a lot, um, but it doesn't stop the uh, requirement for, uh, depending on what zone you're in, if you're only allowed to have a single unit dwelling on the lot, then you still need to be in, um, in accordance with the bylaws that state a single kitchen for a single dwelling unit. Okay. Um, in this case, we have two lots with two dwellings that we're looking to connect. So, I mean, generally, you know, I, I am a planner, so, you know, I, I have given this some serious consideration in, in my thought process. Um, you know, generally variances are granted for, you know, unique or unusual hardship where, you, you know, the size or shape of a lot might impede the ability to you know, develop that land. Um, you know, by granting a variance uh, due to inconvenience or because the zoning doesn't match someone's vision, um, doesn't, you know, it, it, we risk diminishing the power of our bylaws and the good thought that went into their creation. Um, but, uh, you know, the idea behind land use um, land use zoning is to ensure the built environment has a pleasing coherence, is predictable and orderly, and is compatible with the neighborhood. That's one of the main reasons we created land use zoning. The intent of setbacks are, as stated in our staff report here, there's both an aesthetic and a practical reason. Um, you know, they are there to provide separation, privacy, access, and a consistent kind of visual makeup. I, in this case, you know, um, the separation, the privacy, and the access are not a concern, and I think can also be easily undone or rectified should those properties ever be sold separately again. Um, You know, I think in the staff report, it says here that, you know, one of the reasons for not allowing the variance is that the results, that this connection results in what could be considered a single building on more than, um, on more than one lot. 
but I don't think the could be considered is a strong enough reason in itself to deny the variance. Um, as well, we did have the public input and, um, you know, all but one of the neighbors were very supportive of this moving forward. Um, the one exception, um, there seemed to be a lot of uh, concern around the ongoing construction, which I can sympathize with, but at the end of the day is not really, you know, not really the issue. Um, you know, another reason that we allow variances in planning is to provide flexibility in a case that uh, might not have, we might not have anticipated, you know, could not be predicted. And, you know, those types of things, they, they do arise. I do think that this is an incredibly unique situation. Um, it's not one that I believe by allowing this to happen that we're going to, you know, it's going to set a precedent that we're going to see, you know, all of a sudden frequently duplicated. Um, it's very unusual circumstance to connect homes through, you know, through this type of breezeway or corridor. And, you know, for those reasons, I am actually going to support the, uh, this variance and, um, and I don't want to get this wrong in how I say it, but I would say that um, am I allowing the appeal or not allowing the appeal? This this very double net. <laughs> so do you I, so just variance in whichever way that that gets stated. So just to be um, clear, are you are you so to support the variance means you are are not agreeing with staff's recommendation? That that's correct, and okay. And, Just wanted to be know, clear. And I and I did give this a little a lot of thought, and I thank staff very much for for the report and the thought that that went into it. Um, but you know, I I just yeah. Anyway, for the reasons okay. I just laid out, I am supporting the variance. Okay, great. Thank you, and Councilor Cleary, you are good. And don't see anyone else on the speaker's list other than Councillor Mason, who will close. Just one more second. Are the councillors? No? Okay, Councillor Mason. Um, I guess uh, I'll make my points and I'll ask staff to just clarify one thing at the end. Uh, um, my understanding is variant stays if it's sold, even if, it's sold, even if each property is sold to two different owners. So this is a permanent permanent change that will be matched unless they choose to undo it. It's there forever. Uh, secondary, thank you. I see Rosemary nodding. Uh, so uh, we'll take that as a yes. Secondary suites and the garages that were mentioned are all on one lot. Uh, this is a two uh, lots with uh, what would effectively be one unit when connected. Um, this is not going to create new housing. This is not a secondary suite that is limited to 60 square meters on the peninsula. Uh, this is taking two houses and having them uh, be have even less people living in them uh, by by combining them into one building. Uh, the public input that set up the land use bylaw and the center plan and all the amendments to land use bylaw is significantly more than we've seen today for the variances. And so I appeal to my colleagues uh, that uh, this variance should be dismissed because it simply is not something that is contemplated under the land use bylaw or uh, even applicable for variance under the act. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mason. And I will now ask, given there's nobody on the speaker's list or has asked to speak, that the question be called. Question. Uh, those in favor, say aye. 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 That's in favor of allowing the appeal. Yes, that's in favor of allowing the appeal, say aye. And those who are uh, against, please say nay. 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 Um, so that motion fails and the Mr. Chair, just for for clarity for for folks, uh, especially for the minutes and the folks online, uh, would it be useful to have the clerk call the roll just so that we know the votes? If, sure, I, I, I don't see an issue with that. So if clerk, if you want to call the councillors to do the roll, that'd be fine. Sure, so I'll go with Councillor Morse. Nay. Denied. Thank you. Councillor Mason. Mm, against the appeal. Councillor Clary. For the appeal. Councillor Stoddard. You did, Iona.
Well, you remuted. <laughs> right then. There you what go. Is, there we go. Sorry about that. I'm voting against the appeal. Thank you, Councillor Carroll. I'm voting for the appeal. And Mr. Chair, Councillor Smith. Voting against the appeal. So the development officer's decision has been upheld uh, and that motion uh, fails. Thank you applicants and members for uh, the discussion and uh, we will now move on to the next item. Which is uh, six correspondence petitions and delegations. Um, uh, Ms. Clerk, we have correspondence. Yes, so clerk's office received the correspondence for item 511, 512, and 521, and this correspondence was circulated to the committee. Thank you. Um, 6.2 petitions, any petitions, uh, members of community council, don't believe there are any. Um, 6.3 presentations, there are none. Uh, 7.1 uh, staff reports, there are none. Uh, in camera, we do have in camera minutes, and I ask if the uh, member can move the in camera minutes from December 9th. Councillor Cleary moves the adoption of the in camera minutes. Great. Moved by Councillor Cleary, seconded by Councillor Morse. Uh, in camera minutes to move. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All right. All those opposed, say nay. Thank you. Uh, so, the date of the next meeting is February 16th, 2021, uh, and I call for a uh, meeting to be adjourned. Sure. Thank sure you. Enough. Called by Council Stutter. Thank you, colleagues, and everyone who uh, participated in tonight, and staff for always being helpful and useful during our meetings. Uh, everyone, have a good night, and see you around. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night.